Investors Chronicle. Companies and market show. Welcome back, everyone. It is Thursday, the 8th of December, as we record. Joining us on today's show, Julian Hoffman. Hi, Julian. Hello, John. Nice to see you again. And Alex Newman. Hello, Alex. Hi, John. And as normal, hosting Dan Jones. Dan, what is coming up on today's show? Hi, John. Today we are starting with a UK lender, Paragon, slightly different from some of the other UK lenders. We're going to be looking at its recent results. Then we are going to talk about our cover feature this week, which is on the property market and housing and the question of what people in a situation where they might be looking to buy or sell in the near future should be thinking at the moment. And finally, we're going to turn to another result, Moonpig, altogether a less uh, promising performer in recent weeks, recent months. And we're going to expand that out a little bit to look at some of the 2023 prospects for companies like Moonpig, but also companies that reported in recent weeks what they're saying about the year ahead. Sounds good, Dan. Before then, a quick news roundup from the week that's been... First up, recent data has found that the outlook for retail and hospitality this Christmas is not looking all that rosy. The likes of the British Retail Consortium and KPMG point to rising costs and falling consumer spending as reasons for caution. On the other hand, the British Beer and Pub Association has reported the ongoing FIFA World Cup has given boozers a boost. England's recent match against Senegal saw the industry sell an extra 5 million pints compared to a regular Sunday. On Monday, we had news that the Vodafone chief executive Nick Reid has resigned after four years in the job. It came after the telecoms giant downgraded its full-year profit and cash flow guidance last month. Mining giant Glencore has agreed to a payout deal with the Democratic Republic of Congo for $180 million. It's for, quote, any alleged acts of corruption. It takes Glencore's 2022 bribery and corruption penalties to almost $1.7 billion after deals with US, UK and Brazilian authorities. Electrical retailer Currys has stopped using Royal Mail as postal workers prepare for six days of strikes. The CEO Alex Baldock said parcels are easily switchable to another provider. Royal Mail reported a £219 million operating loss in the six months to the 25th of September and management insists that it needs to cut 5,000 full-time roles by next spring. British American tobacco shares fell 2% after CEO Jack Bowles warned of volume pressures in the US market. He did, however, maintain that he is confident that full-year guidance will be achieved. And online estate agency Purple Bricks has posted more losses and admitted it could be liable to pay a fine following, quote, instances of non-compliance with regulation. The instances in question were found during an internal review and they await the regulatory oversight. That's all from me. Back to you, Dan, for the rest of the show. So, Paragon, Julian, uh, we'll start with you. I know this is a company uh, you've followed for a while. Uh, It just had its uh, figures out, pretty decent figures, and also quite notably for uh, for a bank and one that's focused to to an extent on buy lending, it, it's still sounding pretty pretty chipper about the year ahead. Yes, that's right. I mean, uh, um, Alex also knows Nigel Terrington. He's he's quite a character, I think, in uh, in that sector. So I, I don't think he'd be uh, anything less than chipper about his own company. But um, uh, what was noticeable was that um, Paragon, uh, unlike um, some other other specialist lenders, seems to have maintained its uh, grip on the buy to let market. Um, at the same time as uh, sort of diversifying the business quite successfully. So they're getting a double um, benefit from it. So, uh, you know, they're, they're getting the the rate rise margin boost uh, that all banks are getting, but they seem to be getting this little finish on the top uh, where they're still earning quite good uh, money in the, in the buy-to-let market. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the SME lending business is also, also seems to be doing very well. So, I mean, that was a diversification thing they did a few years ago, and they've developed that. And, um, it, yeah, it, it, for my money, it's a very well-run type of, uh, you know, it, it's a well-run, not specialist lender that's outside of the mainstream. But 
um, it acts also in a funny way as a kind of bellwether for the, for that particular sector. I think I, I think um, Alex would agree on that. But and then they also got they also had um, the decent, unlike um, say pension funds who had to pay out all their capital for uh, LDI liabilities. They actually did quite well out of um, derivatives contracts. So they're, they're like 190 million up just from from positive to der- derivative movements. But um, it looks like they'll have to give that back anyway once once the rates normalize over the next couple of years. But yes, overall, it a really interesting business. And, um, you know, I mean, they've been going for years and I imagine that they'll continue in the same vein. I don't know, Alex. I mean, you you know them quite well as well, I think. Is that right? What did yeah, you I, I mean, I'm not... I, it's been a couple of years since I was covering the banking beat. But, um, but I think in the interim, the point you alluded to there has been quite interesting, just looking through the results in their diversification push. So the, I think it is fair to say, you know, buy to, I think, I mean, buy to let is, is still the majority of the loan book. Um, but their push into commercial lending, SME, being very selective with their, um, with the, yeah, with the loans they're making is a smart, is a smart move from a diversification purposes. But I mean, even with the buy to let market, and, you know, I, we can obviously come on to that and talk about a lot about property um, today, but I mean, it's it's a it's a very different beast to the high street banks, and you know if you look at you look at just the you know the the gen the, the sort of backdrop to the to the the, the normal mo- the mortgage market, it's such a political subject. It's so it, you know there's so much sensitivity around the rates at which banks um, you know offer their products and. Um, it's it's you know operating in a in a slightly more commercial um uh, part of the market is I, I think to their advantage although you know there are there are definite risks there um even with a slightly with a, a kind of professional buy to let um uh, borrower borrower but borrower base that they they work with yeah, and also, I mean, they just don't have any cost, do they? By contrast, I mean, they they seem to manage. Uh, you know, if you're a mainstream bank, you struggle to get your cost per ratio down below sixty five percent, and I mean, they seem to be well below that. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it helps that they don't have like a thousand branches that nobody uses. So <laughs> that seems to be the uh, it seems to be the way to go. Yeah. Um, I think if there's, I mean, there's one. If there's one um, concern you would have about them is their their reliance on on retail savings market. So, I mean, what the high street banks have got going for them is an ability to somehow maintain these n- enormous, I was looking at Lloyd's, it's, it, you know, they're, they're, uh, they have hundreds of billions in, in UK savings uh, it, of their deposits are UK savings accounts, which yield almost nothing. But they just, they seem to cling on to this business, um, even though there are much better places to, to, for, you know, for retail customers to place their savings. But, I think Harrogate obviously pivoted to that market, which is very active and they can get huge inflows, you know, with, with the launch of fixed income products at the drop of a hat. Um, but it's quite it's quite flighty. So I would be slightly nervous if I was an investor um, at a couple of points that they announced in their in the results um, this this week. One being the fact that their term, the term of their fixed interest retail savings um accounts has has come down slightly 22 months is average so you know they've got a bit of they've got a bit of um you know uh uh yeah a breathing space but at the same time their the average interest rate is about 1.7 percent on those accounts if you're one of these saver uh saving accounts shoppers you know that that there's there are better um that there are better deals on the market now and you'd be looking to switch they have to respond very nimbly to those those pressures um, so that's just one bare point I would I would mention. Yeah, I mean, and also they look at, they're looking at the buy to let market ne- next year with with some caution. I think in some ways, I mean, yeah, you know, they they booked um, they booked some impairments, but that they weren't anything to do. Interestingly, he told me that there wasn't anything to do with the current book. It was what they kind of felt might happen next year. Yeah. Um, which uh, and and they they seem to be quite marginal. It's like barely fifteen million pounds worth of. Um, possible impairments but um i thought that was an interesting that was an interesting point you made um that you know, it's probably not all a one-way bet you just have to choose you know, which one you have to put your money on really yeah but there we go 
Yeah, and that I suppose in in that by Gillette book as well as, as you mentioned, Alex. You know, they they do target the more professional landlords who, according to their own research, in Italy, but they they seem to be the ones who are staying more committed to the market. You know, the pressures right now on uh, by Gillette lending rates seem to be having a greater impact on smaller landlords. So, you know, potentially there's the ability to withstand some some uh, difficulties there. I mean, when I think of Paragon, I and think back to 2008, as I suppose people do with with most banks in in uh, in the UK. You know those those um, memories loom large still to an extent. But do, do we think you know that back then? Obviously, it's a very different situation. It's um, I think we can hopefully assume that next year won't be anything like that. But we are going into a bit of a downturn again. Last time, you know, there was a, a rescue rights issue from Paragon. Clearly, they're nowhere near that situation book is looking quite good as discussed do we think they've kind of learned lessons from that period as well in terms of how what they focus on and how they you know focus on credit quality as we say well uh, yeah i mean i think the credit quality has probably improved doesn't it and uh and also the proportion of risk weighted assets is moving in their favor so uh you know whatever the the basel banking rules are no, <laughs> but uh so you you know from my point, from from our point of view, you know they're quite well capitalised for historically well capitalised, and um, mm. unless there's a total disaster in, yeah, you know, there's. I mean that thing that Alex was alluding to, where there might be a capital flight combined with some sort of um, underlying asset de- uh, de- decline in asset quality, that might be the perfect storm for a company like um, like Paragon. But uh, in a sense, they've done. They've done the best they can to avoid the what you know they've they've done the best they can to avoid the last crisis <laughs> so maybe that would mm. put them in in good stead for the next one but um. i think i think one thing you could definitely i mean i think one of the reasons is from memory so it might be you know slightly hazy but one of the reasons they had um a bad crisis along with all the other banks is that they were one of the principal issuers of of uk of residential mortgage-backed securities and that was obviously you know one yep. of the one of the detonators in the in the gfc so um i mean that market has really has really kind of vanished in recent years so there's not that there's not that danger but yeah i mean just just to go back to the point on i mean the point on the retail savings market is i think is is going to be manageable for them it's just it might mean that it moves against their net interest margins you know, faster over a, a year, one year period than it might do for some of the other uh, of the of the larger banks. Um, I mean, I think it's something they can certainly manage. Um, it's um, yeah, and and you know, the, the other thing I think they they'll probably be having very very active discussions with their borrowers on you know how much cash they have set aside in in the good years for buy to let landlords, and we you know we'll see you know how well those professional landlords have been preparing their own balance sheets in the next year and you know that you know how that has played out will determine how paragon's uh, loan book you know credit quality holds up on which note we should turn to our cover feature this week i'll stick with paragon for a moment though because their substantial scenario does provide some some hard forecasts for the year ahead, which are you know always interesting to to look at from from this vantage point. However accurate or otherwise they prove, I think they're assuming GDP down 1.1 percent, CPI 11.9 percent next year, which you know is perhaps the most interesting of these three figures, and and house prices down 8.2 percent. Uh, our cover feature this week does look at the housing market and you know the gloomier prospects there. Julian, why don't we start with you because you're in the the uh, fortunate position of having a recently sold a property and perhaps with that in mind as well you're uh, you know relatively downbeat on the prospects for the year ahead of course as we get into in the in the piece there are regional nuances and, and variations depending on your you know your ability to buy and and uh, where you are in life where you're in the market but but why don't we start from a broad view with your take on on housing the UK market next year yeah, I mean, we only managed to flog it because we knocked like twenty five thousand off it. <laughs> right. honest, so it wasn't it wasn't a total success. There is a clearly demand. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't hard in that sense. It was it was it was arduous in in that uh, people kept coming along and then their mortgage, their mortgage deals kept disappearing. That was one that was one issue. Um, 
so there's, there's i'm wondering whether that will continue next year or at least continue in a uh, an accelerated way as rates go up because obviously people budget for a certain at a certain level and uh, when it comes to it the mortgage company says no sorry you can't you can't do that so I mean, you you might you wonder whether that will help to stagnate the market or whether that will cause the market more to stagnate uh, because they're just it's not that there isn't demand it's just that there isn't that they can't match the demand to the financing so yeah, yeah I, you can see that scenario um playing out quite um uh, you know, repetitively over over the coming year um and I, I think it also depends where you are i mean it wasn't you know in a, in a london borough with a tube station down the road um you know in relative terms it's, it's not going to be difficult to sell anything whereas if you want to buy a trophy um property in cornwall uh with no services uh, at the end of the a30 uh you're, you're not <laughs> my feeling is you're not going to find it so easy to get rid of it particularly if you bought it in a hurry in the in the pandemic to escape the lockdowns but um there, so there's there's there's, there's you know those regional differences are going to come in quite um quite rapid, quite uh markedly i think and well one of the reasons we uh, uh did this piece was because there are some interesting dynamics right now in terms of you know time and time lags i think uh insofar as you might think now is an awful time to buy a property, you know, certainly versus recent years, if you're viewing it on a short term price appreciation point of view, which is, of course, not really the way you should view property anyway, if it's a roof over your head. But at the same time, you know, mortgage rates have got ahead of uh, base rates, you know, they obviously shot up in September with the mini budget. And there is a suggestion, you know, the argument that they may pretty much have peaked already, which is something I've thought for a few weeks. And so far, that's kind of held firm, we'll see how long that lasts into next year. But with rates already effectively debating a Bank of England base rate in excess of four, maybe even 5%. You know, it might be that the point of peak pain is here. What that means next year for the market is a, is a different question, I suppose. But it might be that, you know, waiting a month or two will get you a better mortgage rate, will get you the, if you're a buyer, will get you the ability to have a, have a discount on the property as, as you found, Julian. And if you're looking to the long term, you need to move, then, you know, why not move? Well, great. You know, it'll just take us back to 2005, which um, was an infinitely better year in my view. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it, the, it must it has to correct. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, it's going to force it, whether the the, peak, the rates have peaked or not. Um, it, it's going to, the, there will be an attritional effect, whatever happens. I, 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 I think that's a slightly, you know, a specious debate, really. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it seems. The consensus certainly is there will be a, a decent price correction next year. Alex, what's your what's your view? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things here. I mean, like, like you said, there are so many hypotheticals, and it is it's hard to sketch out time, the question of timing and property purchases. Um, you know, in a sort of universal uh, uh, soundbite, which will be meaningful to everyone who might be on either side of a transaction. Um, I mean, you know, at one point you could say it. it should you wait to buy a property it might sound like a bit of a trite question to be asking you know if you've been wanting to buy a home and that you've been desperate to do so in you know in the recent in recent months and things are only going to get more desperate really i mean you, you'd sort of you know it's it's a very difficult position with rents so high as they are relative to income that depresses further prospective buyers ability to save so that's not a great position to be in and i imagine there you just want to buy a property if you can and you're not looking to time anything. The question on timing, really, with the housing market, is you've got to assume that that everyone is trying to time things to a degree. I mean, life, mm. you know, everyone's uh, life circumstances mean that they are, you know, you might be making a purchase or or selling because of whatever's going on in your life. But people do kind of act in a very herd like way in markets. And if the dynamic we see at the moment is that you know things are obviously clearly a lot less competitive than they were a few months ago, I suppose the risk is you know the longer you you, you wait, you know to take the flip side of your your um, you know what you mentioned Dan about about rates potentially peaking, um, it might not it might not pan out that way. I mean one big risk I, I think potentially could be coming next year is another loss of faith in the government's fiscal regime okay we're not going to have a repeat of the mini budget but since sunak and hunt took over we've had very calm waters and you know fields that sort of 
the highest level since the financial crisis can be called calm in the gilt market. But, you know, if there was going to be a sudden loss of confidence in how and who is going to buy all the government debt that needs to be issued next year, um, you know, things could could pan out, you know, badly if you were if you're thinking of sitting on the fence and hoping that Lloyd's is going to bring their their two year fix down from 6.5 to to five. I mean, it, it, I, I suspect there's a reason for the, the high street banks holding the rates at the levels they are at the moment. It's not just because they're being really mean uh, and not wanting to pass on, you know, net interest um, savings to uh, to customers. So, so yeah, it's a really delicate balance, I think, at the moment. But um, but assume yeah. but assume everyone else is trying to time it as well as the only thing I can say. Yeah. I think that's that's definitely fair on rates, you know, maybe like with inflation, perhaps, you know, maybe that the peak is in, but but uh, it could equally take a very long time for them to come down meaningfully. Uh, the other, I mean, we do, we do touch on a lot of uh, aspects in the piece as best we can. One, one other factor which um, lends itself to something you were saying, Gillian, is, is downsizing. You know, people who already have a property who might be considering moving or, you know, moving down, certainly demographically, a lot of people will be in that boat. I think maybe a lack of suitable housing is an issue there but also now you know they may not want to crystallize what presumably are some decent gains at this time as well which all plays into the kind of the inertia factor you know we've already had a year where there's been very little property on the market even relative to post-crisis levels and with a large proportion of uh, uk homeowners having no mortgage at all there is no incentive to move there either there's going to be no financial pressure so I mean, in some ways, that if you're again looking purely on a price basis, that that could help, you know, avoid price discovery, and therefore there won't be too much of a move. But it doesn't necessarily speak to a, a well-functioning property market at the same time if there's simply no transactions at all. So, yeah, it's a difficult one. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we you know where we live in the southwest, it's like everyone objects to everything being built. So there's no there's no supply coming onto the market either. So you, you've got that. Yeah, you know, it's not you know there's a dysfunction there's a natural dysfunction there anyway and obviously if we down we, we couldn't really downsize anymore we'd probably have to move into the garage if that were the case but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ideally we need to upsize but uh, i'm not sure how, how that's going to happen at the moment yeah but it's it's not um you just can't easy you can't easily say what the impact of rates is if the, the underlying market is not functional i think that's mm. you know, there might be a completely different incentive from now on and maybe because you know all the people who have no mortgages are starting to you know retire and need nursing care i mean that might be the next big liquidation you know the, the great baby boomer liquidation might be just around the corner but um you know that might that might have an impact yeah well we should move on from property for for now as i say this is the cover feature this week there's a lot of uh uh nuance and specifics in there so do have a look if that takes your interest now though we're going to talk about moon pig which is a yeah. completely different kind of business <laughs> <laughs> again not necessarily the most positive uh story over the last year by which i mean it's had a horrible time of things the latest figures aren't much better i mean it's really caught between uh two terrible issues from its perspective of one you know dwindling uh consumer demand and two the inability for its products to reach doors with the uh, continued Royal Mail strikes. Well, I, I think the fact that I've, I haven't received my last three Investor Chronicle magazines tells you the the problems that Moon Pig might be having in terms mm. of, of getting the product out there. Um, so yes, they've got that issue. Yeah, unless they set up their own distribution network for the entire country, um, they have to rely on the Royal Mail. So as soon as the Royal Mail sorts out its strike issues, then that will actually be an, an immediate benefit for Moonpig. They should get their volumes back up, up to a certain level. Um, the other one is is more it's harder to call because I, I mean I was looking back through the copy of this and they had been a very early beneficiary of the pandemic. Um, you know, a, pa- a pandemic. Um, what's the word? Um, benefit. Yeah, lockdown winners. I think lockdown winners. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, that effect lasted quite a long time. I think she lo- more than people expected. And it's it's only really in the last couple of quarters that that has started to wear off. Um, and I don't know, you know, it could be just uh, that people got into the habit of sending these things and uh, 
And then suddenly realized they could all go shopping without having to wear a mask and uh, they could buy greeting cards that way. Um, so they, 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 they had a long, you might say a long pandemic. And then as soon as that start, that effect where wore off, they got this distribution issue and, uh, you know, it's just flattened the the share price over the last year. I think it's down six, more than sixty percent uh, year to date. But uh, it, it, I mean, the, it's in a way you you have to start asking the question whether there isn't a value case though, because um, it's still a business that, despite its issues, is generating margins of fifty four, fifty five percent, and um, that that isn't that is pretty. You know, with, with all that background, that is pretty impressive and. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the shares have fallen so much that uh, you know the value case must start to kick in, you know, as a sort of recovery buy before long. I mean, I don't know exactly you know when the timing of that is, but um, you know, you, if you if you decided to pick up pick them up in the new year, um, and it's a presidential third presidential year, as I think uh, Simon Thompson was saying the other day, you can't lose money in the stock market in the third <laughs> year of a. <laughs> he, he, did say that. he did say that yeah <laughs> um so there might be some bearing on that for me but you never know but uh yeah i mean i you know, i've always thought that you know they started off with a very high valuation it, you know it's a classic growth company with a story it's an aim you know aim story uh and it's almost that like now is it's where it's hitting the reality where, where you know the value the valuation is catching up with the reality of the business case and and actually that is quite an interesting point for for an investor to look at i think at least that's my that would be I my think, take on it i think mm. beyond uh, uh democratic senators sending each other greetings cards congratulating congratulating one another on on holding <laughs> holding the senate um I, I i think it's i think the i think the growth story that was sold at IPO, so they IPO at the beginning of uh, 2021. Obviously, off the back of a very, very strong year, as you say, is definitely kind of stuttered. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, for me, for me, the value the value case is a little is a little harder to see here, and there's a reason why they've they've derated so spectacularly, it's because I think they're struggling to communicate where the where the growth is going to come from next. Though, no, I. I I was looking into this before we um, we started recording. I mean, my anecdotal sense is that is that younger generations send greeting cards less frequently. But apparently, it's not so, and there's a lot of hope within the greeting. Millennials are going to rescue it um, because they do send more than uh, Gen Xs or you know grumpy uh, 40, 50 year olds. Um, and that there is some there is potentially a growth story there, which might support a brave value investor but um i think yeah i think it's a little bit hard to, to make the case very forcefully that moon pig is um is going back to the moon where it started or when it relisted um yeah it's i mean they started off way too porky really in terms of the <laughs> valuation there so yeah. i had to get that in yeah that, that that is an interesting growth case so alex because yeah as you say the and as Julian says, the, a lot of the factors right now, you know, out of their hands, you know, both coming off the pandemic boom, but also, you know, Royal Mail, mm. there is a, a business under, you know, underneath it all, which is looking quite good. But the question is, yeah, how much of that growth was just pulled forward or, you know, entirely artificial in the pandemic? It's hard to say, but that, that is interesting. You know, I mean, people like me sometimes, especially this time of year, when you when you get a bit get a bit harried for time and you need to send a load of cards online can be the the quick option but i'm not sure yeah. that's um, uh, a an anecdote on which to build a business but but there is something there perhaps I, I mean the other thing you know and it's very trite to sort of sum up millennials look you, you always see um companies or investors talk about you know generational cohorts as they're um, as if they're a monolith mm. but if there's one other thing that you know they do bang on about about millennials or, or younger consumers is their you know, is the appeal of authenticity in their in their consumption habits. I wonder if a kind of, you know, click your card online and send it out um, at a quite high price point um, without necessarily the personal touch is, you know, is, you know, is means that 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 sort of younger card givers are necessarily going to flock to Moonpig, even if they are sending greeting cards I, mean, um, I thought millennials were all about quality stationery and you know expensive pens and sort of hieroglyphs 
Oh, you know, calligraphy rather. You know, in your, in your greeting cards. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's also that. <laughs> we've read that as well because they've they've also rescued board games apparently. Yeah, that's the uh, the the other thing. Yet, uh, but anyway, that's, we're straying off topic. Well, on that on that note, Moonpig, I think they obviously have tried to emphasize, you know, the gift side of the business, the non greetings card side mm-hmm. with which you associate them. You know, so attempt perhaps to to play both those sides of things, and perhaps the gifts they offer are a little more more authentic. But uh, but yeah, let, let let's end the podcast. We are running short of time, but just a quick look at uh, some of the the looks towards twenty twenty three that we've had in the last few weeks from results, Julian. I know you uh, were talking about this earlier. There's some things you have been looking at, or some some noises. Something yeah, there's there. some interesting stuff. I mean, energy and industrial companies are going to be having a hard time next year. Um, uh, the, the result that came up this week, there was Victrex, which is uh, everyone's favorite latex company. Um, so, I mean, the interesting thing about that those kind of businesses is they're quite good at managing their cost base. So um, they only really have to close or open a factory somewhere and that knocks, you know, they can get some savings out of it. But um, they're definitely struggling with with energy costs, and you know the longer that goes on, the more attrition it will have uh, it, it, it'll have on the, on the bottom line. Um, so there was that that uh, I found quite interesting, and the other one that that's coming across is professional services uh, companies next year. So you've got the um, kind of the lawyer and the business the business service uh, type companies, and what they were saying was was that um, uh, there could be a quite a good counter cyclical appeal to those type of businesses because as soon as things go south everybody starts suing each other um and that generates litigation and um professional you know other types of professional services and and so those types of businesses tend to take off um when the economy isn't doing quite as well so i thought that that was quite an interesting um counter growth story um you know whereas usually it's uh, you know next year for, for a lot of people it's just going to be you know doom and gloom in a in a relative sense you know if they can't offset their their basic costs so yeah probably the message is avoid avoid too many industrials but um have a have a good look at um, business services because then that might be where the growth is on a uh at a corporate level i suppose and that legal point we have had the example in the past couple of days as well, uh, when the growth stops, the suing begins in terms of Pfizer, BioNTech, suing, counter suing Moderna over mRNA. So we're very much in the fallout period of that uh, post vaccine jubilation, I think now. That does wrap up nicely for today, I think. So thank you to Julian and to Alex and to John. And thank you to you for listening as usual. We will be back next week with another Companies and Market show. 